So for chapter eight, the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Normally, I don't really read through the focus of the chapter or the objectives themselves for each single unit because you're welcome to read through them yourselves. But in this chapter, I feel there's some important things we need to talk about before I get started. In this chapter, we're really gonna examine the electronic structure of the atom. How is it put together? How does it act in that sense? Atoms and molecules themselves are able to interact with light and they absorb some wavelengths and they reflect at other wavelengths. Light does travel, okay? It's like this, think about the speed of light, it travels a certain distance, a certain wavelength. And these atoms and molecules are inter able to interact with these wavelengths or with light at these specific wavelengths. And that's what causes the colors we see around us. So for example, today I'm wearing a maroon shirt. The reason it's maroon has to do with the colors that my shirt is both absorbing and reflecting that it's coming you know, off of the sun or off of the light around us. This is what absolutely creates all the colors you see. Molecules, though, can interact with many different types or forms of radiation. This includes visible light, which is the colors we see, but also things like ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays, radio waves, IR, or infrared rays. Spectroscopy is a um, technique or um, a field Spectroscopy is how we study how these substances absorb and emit this radiation. Spectroscopy is what allows us, the study of this is what allows us to understand the electronic structure of the atom. How and why are the electrons behaving like they are? So with that, in this chapter, we're going to focus on the quantum mechanical model, electromagnetic spectrum, energy, wavelength, and frequency, speed of light and speed of sound, continuous and discrete, discrete spectrums, absorption and emission spectrums, the particle-like and wave-like behavior of light and electrons, classical and quantum mechanics, the Bohr model, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, Schrodinger's equation, SPD and F orbitals and quantum numbers. There's a lot of terms here. A lot of terms probably seem kind of like, what? You have no clue where we're coming from. We're gonna get through all that in this chapter. But overall, this chapter is still relatively short. But when you're focusing back and studying for this chapter, these are the things you need to understand in addition to the objectives for each section. So for this first section, I really am going to talk to you guys about the electromagnetic spectrum. You need to know the relative positions of the various regions on the electromagnetic spectrum. So what I mean by that is you need to know where do radio waves reside? Where does X-rays reside? Gamma rays, IR, etc. You need to understand and be able to put these different areas or regions in order by increasing or decreasing energy, wavelength, and frequency. You need to know and be able to use the relationship lambda nu equals c, which is how we can relate wavelength and frequency to the speed of light. You need to know and be able to interconvert the commonly, units, um, commonly used units of frequency and wavelength. You should know and be able to use Planck's equation. Planck's equation tells us the energy of one photon is equal to h nu. You need to know and be able to use the following terms related to nature of light and atomic spectra, which is wavelength, frequency, refraction and diffraction, and continuous spectrum, line spectrum, a photon, quantum, and interference. So the quantum mechanical model. Quantum mechanical model, first thing we talk about is electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is a type of energy that travels through space at the speed of light. It has oscillating electric and magnetic fields, but this includes visible light. We can characterize this electromagnetic radiation by its wavelength, frequency, and energy. So we use lambda to represent wavelength. Lambda is the name for the Greek letter. We use that to represent wavelength. Frequency, it's actually this kind of weird shaped V. It's not a true V. This would be a V, which we'll use for velocity as well in this chapter. But this weird shaped V is called nu, and it represents your frequency, and then E for energy. Note here the units for wavelength are units of length, meter, nanometer, centimeter. 
they're all units of length because it's measuring the length of how long that wave is. Frequency is measured in hertz. One hertz is one cycle per second, which we can say one over seconds or seconds to the minus one. And energy you're gonna find in joules and kilojoules. So we've got your electromagnetic spectrum. Now, before I talk much about the electromagnetic spectrum, I just wanna specify that the energy of this electromagnetic radiation Talking about electromagnetic radiation, the en energy here is not emitted like waves. Instead, it's emitted in packets that we call quanta or quantum. It's small, specific packets of energy. Quantum is the singular term. We have photons. A photon is the smallest quantum or packet of radiation. And we're going to talk about the equations, and we'll find that energy is equal to H, which is Planck's constant, it's a constant we're going to learn, times the frequency. What this means, though, is that the energy of a single photon is proportional to the frequency. We also find that the energy is proportional to the inverse of the wavelength. And we will talk about all that um, when we talk about equations. We'll see the equations themselves. But you do need to understand what a quanta and a quantum is. A quantum is a single, small, um, the smallest, a photon is the smallest quantum or packet of radiation. A quantum is just a single packet of energy. Quanta is multiple packets of energy. So the energy here is emitted like a particle, not a wave. That may seem kind of strange to you right now, but it's because we're going to find out electrons behave as both particles and waves. So the light that's being emitted is in, being emitted like a single particle. Now this diagram here is our electromagnetic spectrum. You've probably seen this before in physics. If not, you're going to see it when you take physics. You do need to know the relative regions of this electromagnetic spectrum to each other. What I mean by that is you need to know gamma rays have the highest energy. They are next to X-rays, UV vis, the visible region, infrared, microwave, and radio. So you need to know gamma rays, X-rays, the ultraviolet region, the visible region, infrared region, microwaves, and radio waves. You need to know that if I go this way on the scale, that increases my wavelength. So if I go from gamma rays to radio waves, I'm increasing wavelength. If I go from radio waves to gamma rays, I'm increasing my energy and my frequency. So when you look at this chart here, we see up here, this shows me my wavelength. Radio waves, which are way down here, have the longest wavelength. Gamma rays on the other side have the shortest wavelength. The shorter that wavelength, the higher the energy is. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Why and what does that mean? When we look at this chart here, we see amplitude versus wavelength. Wavelength is the difference in height between the two peaks. How, ma how many meters did it take to go from the height of one peak to the height of the next peak? Or the crest of the peaks? How, how long did it take to get there? That is a wavelength. A cycle is how many times it cycles through one entire wave. 
the longer this wavelength, the longer that frequent, the longer it's going to take to reach a full cycle. So the, um, the lower our frequency will be. Energy is inversely proportional to this wavelength. The longer these wavelengths, the lower the energy we have because the less frequency we have, the less cycles we have per second. How long does it take to get from here? Let's say one second is right here to one here. I've barely gone through an entire cycle. If a second is here to here, I've gone through multiple cycles. Here to here, here to here, here to here. I'm seeing I'm going through less and less cycles as I go. So I'm eventually not even completing a full cycle. So energy and frequency are proportional to each other, whereas wavelength is the opposite. Amplitude versus wavelength we see here. Um, amplitude is just the height of that crest. So little picture down here, kind of showing us a nice picture. Wavelengths here, here, and here, we all have the exact same wavelength. The difference in these is the amplitude of those waves. And so amplitude relates back to how dim or how bright something is. We see with a low amplitude, we have a very dim light. With a high amplitude, we have a much brighter light. So amplitude is just going to show us how bright or dim is that light, not um, the wavelength is going to be the same here. You also need to know the wavelength range of visible light. So this range in here, we need to know that this is approximately 400 to 750 nanometers. So you should know that the wavelength of visible light is approximately 400 to 750 nanometers. Um, lastly, what I want to talk about here, let me erase this, so pause this if you need to. I want to talk to you guys about how we've memorized this visible region. If you've grown up in the U.S., you've probably learned and memorized the term Roy G. Biv. Stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, purple, or violet. So this is how we've been taught to memorize. It is Roy G. Biff, and that's how the colors of the rainbow come together. What I want you to realize, though, is that this is written backwards in terms of energy, or it's written in terms of lowest to highest energy. I guess it's a better way to say that. Red is the lowest energy. Purple is the highest energy. So if you were to write it like Roy G. Biv, right on this scale, right on your electromagnetic spectrum, this is in fact backwards. You would need to write this, in, if you wanted to match where it says, you know, gamma, um, gamma, your x-rays, your UV region, your visible region, et cetera, you would have to write V-I-B-G-Y-O-R, which other countries have learned to that mnemonic instead. But I want you to recognize that this is written lowest to highest energy. We write the electromagnetic spectrum by standards from highest to lowest energy. So this is higher energy here. lower energy. So this is written backwards from that. So you need to be aware of that and realize that red has a lower energy than purple and recognize which way it goes. So with all of that, a couple things we need to know. First of all, E of a photon. What do I mean by E of a photon? E means energy. We can measure the energy of one photon of light. So we, uh, when we say E of a photon, I mean the energy of one photon of light. This units here would be joules per photon. So the joules of energy per one photon of light. You can also report this as joules per a mole of photons or kilojoules per mole of photons. So although it doesn't specify, when it says mole here, this means mole of photons. We also have Planck's constant. You need to just memorize Planck's constant. The faster you memorize this constant, the easier this chapter will be for you guys, okay? You need to know lowercase h means Planck's constant. Why isn't it p? p is pressure. p is probably other things too. c is the speed of light. 
we use H for Planck's constant, lowercase h. Planck's constant has a value of 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. C is the speed of light. It is a lowercase c. And the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. You also need to know the speed of light. The other one I have written on here you do not need to know is the speed of sound. I just have it on here for reference. Speed of sound is 340 meters per second. The reason I write that on here for reference and show you this picture here is that if you've ever watched a thunderstorm, I love thunderstorms. I think it's some of the coolest things to watch and listen to. I love the lightning. I love the sound of the thunder, everything. But you'll often see the lightning hit. And then a few seconds later, you'll actually hear the thunder or you'll hear the crack of lightning. And that's because if you look at the difference here, the speed of sound is 340 meters per second. Sound travels at 340 meters per second. Seems pretty fast, but the speed of light is even faster. 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I say 2.998, you're welcome to memorize it either way. But this is the same as 2998, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 meters per second compared to 340 meters per second. So the speed of light is just, well, a lot faster than the speed of sound. You do not need to know the speed of sound. I only put it on here for reference. You absolutely must know the speed of light. Again, you can memorize it as 2.998 times 10 to, the, um, 10 to the positive eighth meters per second or 3.00 times 10 to the positive eighth meters per second. I don't care which one you memorize it as, but you need to know it to at least two decimal places here. And then Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule a second. Okay, emission spectra, continuous spectra, and line spectra. What do these things mean? In emission spectra in general, is um, a continuous, spec uh, continuous or line spectra. So emission can be continuous or line spectra. Here what's happening is electrons were excited and now when they return to their ground state, they release energy in the form of light. How were they excited? They were given energy, probably in the form of light. They're now gonna release that energy in the form of light as well. But one way or another, we gave these electrons energy. They were excited up to a higher energy state. Now they need to return back down to their ground state. In order to return to their ground state, they need to release that energy they absorbed and they're going to release it in the form of light. So if you got to ever do this in the lab, it's actually a lot of fun. We take these little lamps, like this one be filled with hydrogen gas, and we excite it, and then we can look through it we're through a little slit, and we can separate out the different colors as they come out. From this, though, we get a continuous spectra, and we get line spectra. A continuous spectra is white light. It's all the colors of the rainbow. And let me move this down. So this is continuous spectra. All the colors of the rainbow. A, white, a light bulb, think about a light bulb like you guys think of with you know regular light bulb. If we were to look at a light bulb ourselves, it looks white or maybe yellow, but mainly white to us. Um, the sun. Same thing, continuous spectra. 
If we were to take that light bulb though and look at it through a diffraction grating, that's what this is doing here is it's diffracting the light into each individual wavelength. When we look at it through a diffraction grating, we see the entire rainbow. So it's white light is what creates all the colors of the rainbow. So if you're wearing a shirt that's white, what's actually happening is that shirt is reflecting back every single color in the rainbow at you at one time. It's kind of hard to think about it that way, that white light is literally every single color and your eye processes it as white, but that's true. Your eye is processing all those colors together as white. So if you ever look at the sun, don't look at it directly, but off to the side through diffraction grating, you will see all the colors of the rainbow. The other form of spectra we have is a line spectra. In a line spectra, we have discrete lines. So oxygen, neon, helium, barium, um, emission and absorption I'll talk about in just a sec, but all of these are types of line spectra. We see individual lines. Now these ones are a little more clearly individual lines coming through. These do have individual lines in here though. These are the lines that are specific to this element that we see coming through. So helium is going to absorb light at specific wavelengths. It's then going to emit light at those specific wavelengths, which correlates back to a specific color that we see. It's not the entire rainbow, it's a discrete line. The difference between emission and absorption here, most often we look at an emission, emission spectra, we can also look at absorption. Emission is when it's releasing the energy back, it's emitting. Absorption is when it's absorbing the light. So what we see for an absorption spectrum is where we had the solid lines before, we now have black lines because that color, that energy has been absorbed by the particles themselves. We're not gonna see it, it's gonna show up as black. So in growing up, I was out, even though I lived in the North, I was always told my mom on really hot summer days to not wear dark colored shirts outside because they absorb all the color. And any time I wore black, she'd be like, do you know how hot it's going to be today? Do not wear a black shirt. And it's true. Black absorbs all color. Black is the absence of light. And so if you, are, you go outside in a black shirt in the summer, it's going to be hotter than going outside in a white shirt. The white is reflecting all the colors back, whereas the black is absorbing all the colors. So the fundamental equations we need. You guys need to know these equations. Um... You need to be able to manipulate them and use them. First, we've got lambda nu equals C. Lambda being your wavelength. Nu being frequency. And that should say seconds to the minus one or one over seconds. C being speed of light. which is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. The speed of light is equal to your wavelength times your frequency. Just memorize it. This is just um, manipulating the equation above, algebraic manipulation. If we had to solve for lambda instead, we could rearrange that equation and solve for lambda. What you see here though, is that lambda is proportional to the inverse of frequency. We expect that because when we look back at our electromagnetic spectrum up here, we see that as our wavelength is getting shorter and shorter, our frequency is getting higher and higher. So we expect that the wavelength is in fact proportional to the inverse of frequency. You can also rearrange that to say frequency equals speed of light over lambda. My recommendation, memorize one equation. You should be able to manipulate and get the other two. We also have Planck's law. Planck's law tells us that the energy is equal to H times V. E is energy. H is Planck's constant. Which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th 
joule seconds and V or technically that's not V. I'm, I apologize. Um, we're going to look at V as in velocity a little bit. Um, new is frequency. So here we find that because this is a constant here, energy is proportional to our frequency. So again, because speed of light was a constant up here, we found our wavelength proportional to one over our frequency. We can substitute in here because we've seen over here we can solve for nu, and we know nu is equal to speed of light divided by the wavelength. We can substitute that into our equation here, which is what I've done here. So this is equal to nu. Equals h nu equals hc over lambda. I don't care which ones you memorize as long as you can do them. But this also shows us we know that both h and c are constants, so energy is proportional to 1 over lambda, which we expected because we saw that on our electromagnetic spectrum. Or our, um, yeah, our electromagnetic spectrum, we see that as we, our wavelength increases, our energy and frequencies decrease. As our wavelength decreases, energy and frequencies increase. What does all, all this mean, though, and what can I do with it? Well, again, there's a bunch of problems at the end of the chapter you can work, but for this specifically, let's just go ahead and work a quick example. What is the wavelength of a radio signal operating at a frequency of 90.1 megahertz? And what is the energy of this radio signal expressed in kilojoules per mole? So number one, I want to know the wavelength of a radio signal operating at a frequency of 90.1 megahertz. Lambda nu equals C. Or for lambda equals C over nu. I know C, speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. 90.1 megahertz. One hertz is equal to one over seconds. This is a megahertz. You need to remember what mega is. Mega is 10 to the sixth. So one megahertz is equal to 10 to the sixth hertz. You can go ahead and put that in as full dimensional analysis. I'm just going to put it into the number. Therefore, I know that 90.1 times 10 to the 6th seconds to the minus 1 is the same as 90.1 megahertz. This gives me 3.33 meters as my answer. Does that answer make sense? A radio signal of 3.33 meters? Yes. I know it's hard to make sense of does this answer make sense when you're still learning these concepts? But radio waves are really, really long. So yes, that answer actually makes complete sense. Now that I have the wavelength, I can figure out the energy. I want the energy of this radio signal expressed in kilojoules per mole. Well, I know that the energy of a photon is equal to h nu. H, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. Planck's constant. And speed of light. you do just need to know those constants. And I'm going to multiply this by my frequency. 90.1 times 10 to the 6 seconds to the minus 1. Just to show you those, those you cancel. This gives me 5.97 times 10 to the minus 26 joules per photon. Because it's the energy of one photon. I want to know this in kilojoules per mole though. So I don't want just joules, I want kilojoules and I want this expressed per mole of photons, not per photon. So write down what I wanna know, number of kilojoules per mole equal 5.97 times 10 to the 26th joules per photon 
Again, you can convert the photons to moles of photons first or the joules to kilojoules. I don't care. I just tend to do my numerators first. One kilojoule is 10 to the third joules. And I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons per one mole of photons. Joules have canceled out, photons are canceled out, and I have an answer of 3.60 times 10 to the minus fifth kilojoules per mole of photons. And so now I know that the wavelength of the radio signal operating a frequency of 90.1 megahertz is 3.33 meters, and the energy of this radio signal expressed in kilojoules per mole is 3.6 times 10 negative fifth kilojoules per mole. Very long wavelength, very small energy. And yes, all of that makes sense because the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. And radio waves are really, really low in energy and really long in wavelength.